program started, it launched 10 companies to 300 potential investors in August in Adelaide. And we are lucky to have that expanding in Sydney and Melbourne uh, later this month, in Sydney, November 15 through 17, and Melbourne, November 22 and 24. Um, Dr. Matthews has a doctorate from Harvard and is recognized as an international expert on entrepreneurial leadership and growth companies. She was on the founding team of the U.S. Kauffman Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership and has authored and co-authored numerous books and articles on business growth. Dr. Matthews, welcome and for being here with us today. I call you Jenna. You may indeed, Sandy. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm passionate about helping founders grow their companies. And founders have to be passionate to start them as well. <laughs> they so, do. <laughs> so we're here to discuss those mistakes. And there are many, many mistakes that entrepreneurs make. And in the purpose of time, we really need to maybe maybe a few of them. But one of the great quotes uh, that, that just to, to, uh, to tip us off is uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt, who once said, um, you should learn from the mistakes of others because you can't live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> so I think that's an appropriate uh, trigger point for our discussion today for entrepreneurs and growth companies. You know, Sandy, that's exactly right. And, and helping entrepreneurs get smarter quicker is one of the tricks. And that's why I've designed those sort of programs. That's where we're doing webinars. That's where we're doing leader forums. That's what the accelerator is all about that will um, be going again starting in January which is to help entrepreneurs in concert with others learn together, learn from each other, and not have to make all the same mistakes individually. Right. So let, let me kind of cruise through really quickly what I'm going to talk about. As I've worked with companies all over the world, founders trying to, to, to figure out and to, to grow, not grow, stumbling, failing, whatever, um, I see three big problems. And usually when I go in and start working with the company, the reason why they aren't growing or why they're failing is one of these three. So right. I call them three big mistakes. Okay, great. Let's hear them then. One is not being focused on customers. And I'll come back to each of these uh, uh, in more detail. Great. So customer focus is one. Second is that they haven't developed the foundation they need to grow and they don't have a roadmap. So I'll talk about what is the foundation, what are the building blocks that you need in order to grow. And third is... They don't know what they don't know about growing a company. Mm -hmm. And so what you don't know comes comes back to bite you. And so understanding what is the journey and what are the uh, signposts along the way and how do you need to change in your role. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Okay, great. And I just want to uh, announce to those listeners is that obviously we'd be loving to hear your questions too later on uh, before the end of the program. We'll take uh, questions from listeners as well, because I'm sure you all have uh, burning issues to discuss with Jenna. So, um, yes, I mean, that, let's go Let's go to that customer uh, focus, because part of that focus, too, is, uh, you know, we're living in a very technology-centric entrepreneurial world, which is great, because technology is growth market. But what a lot of startup companies in the technology area tend to do is they focus too much on the technology or too much on the product. And, and ignore the market out there. Um, and this, this happens in other non-tech industries as well. So it's a very, very key thing that in the world of capitalism, and let's face it, that's what we're, that's what we're in with, we're entrepreneurs, um, being the customer and the market are key. Yes. So without customers, you don't have a company, frankly. I mean, that is what we're in business to do, is to, to serve customers. You may have an idea that essentially is worthless without customers. Yes. Um, and if, in fact, you want to be in a for-profit company, you have to develop and deliver something that customers are willing to part with their money for. They find it so valuable, so important, so essential to what they want to do, who they are, what they need to become, they're willing to part with their money for it. So how do you get them engaged in the development of the product is one of the key things. Mm -hmm. You can actually help them create a group, get them involved in your product development, have them testing the technology, having them tell you ways that they would want to use it or, or, or would see it. I call it the voice of the market. Um, I was on an airplane sitting next to a guy who pulled out some things out of his briefcase and said to me, how would you use this? And he put a piece of paper down, took it off and down and off. Turned out it was a, a version of post-it notes that had failed and they had uh, uh, not been successful in it and the kind of adhesive that they'd expected. But they discovered that, the, that they could put it back and take it off several <laughs> times. And, Gosh, would people use that? 
And so they were going around in airplanes, talking to total strangers, asking them, what would you do with something like this? And I gave them two or three ideas. And of course, it's become a multi-billion dollar product category for them, right? So understanding what customers need and want and understanding sort of how to test even your failures and seeing if you can make lemonade out of it. The second part is in the marketing. Understanding that if you're going to market something that you do have, then you really need to do it in terms of what's in it for them. You know, I have made this mistake as well. I'm so excited about the things we've done. Surely people understand why this is exactly what they need. And here's how it's going to run. And here's what the leader forum is. And it's three days. And here's who you be with. And here are the features and the benefits. And somebody reads this and says, why, why would I care? What, why, why should I be interested in this at all? What's the problem that I have that it's going to solve? So even your marketing materials have really got to be focused on what is the customer's need or want if you want to get them. Right, so you've got some experience in this as well, Sandy. You've been, you're a successful entrepreneur, so well, by all means, chime in here. Well, no, I mean, I just find that, um, uh, I mean, I come, my background is in journalism first, so I learned from the market that way as being an observer and a reporter and commentator on entrepreneurship and specifically in the tech sector. And then I went into venture capital in Silicon Valley and, um, and, and, and saw it again from another angle where we were funding you know, entrepreneurs and Australian entrepreneurs at that because it was an Australian VC company. But the whole purpose was to get them integrated or funded, early stage funding, and then integrating them into the US market, which of course is the world's, was the world's largest market. So um, what, what, what we found too is that the balance between how fortunate it is for an entrepreneur to have a, have a certain amount of naivety, which is great because if you really knew what you're getting yourself into, you know, if you if you if you had to look at it, you know, ha had the hard slog that growing any business is, there would be so many reasons you could justify not doing it. So a little bit of naivety is fantastic, but then what it's really all about is being able to know that you don't know many many things, and to be able to put your hand up and ask and seek the help of mentors, and that means it means you know experienced mentors and growing the network, experienced entrepreneurs and, 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 and mentors and other people that have done it before. But as you say, it is being on a plane or on a bus or in a park, and and, and getting someone next to you and saying, "What do you think of this?" You know, I have this idea. What do you think of that? Because often that sort of feedback can be really important in guiding you through it. Right. So, one of the most successful companies I've ever worked with is a company that called me when they were 30 and the CEO said, I just read your book and, 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 and you wrote about my brother and me. Um, we've never managed more than 10 of anything and we've gone through 60 people. <laughs> we have 30 at the moment. Right. Uh, so we clearly don't know what we're doing. And uh, as I started working with them and helped them grow to 300 people in three mm -hmm. years and then they were valued a couple years later a shade under a billion dollars wow, when they were yeah, invested. What, what I realized is he approached it always from a marketing perspective. Sort of what do our customers need? What do we give? What are we selling um, that they need? Not what are we pushing, but what are we selling that they need? And then we develop it. So there was very much of a marketing and sales focus. Sometimes those entrepreneurs are, are even more successful than the technology ones because the technology is just so in love with their technology that of course the world's going to want this and then they're really offended if, the, if it doesn't. Well, I think you know, the, the, the history of entrepreneurship and big business has been littered with exactly those stories of how the technology even may have been better than a competing product that did not win in the market for all those other reasons like marketing customer focus. So, um, so it is true. So perhaps we could go on to talk about the focus, you know, number two. Number two, right. So it, I, I talk about the foundation of growth. There are three building blocks. First is a really compelling mission that attracts people. Attracts people as in staff in the beginning, people who will join you to do something more than just have a job and earn a living because, you know, they're going to create save the whales or poverty or something. I remember Change one of the entrepreneurs who said to me, like, I've got to figure out a better mission than just coming in and doing games, right? I mean, other people will work for nothing to save the whales. So right. I've got to figure this out in terms of my own business. Right. So so the mission, uh, advisors will be attractive. I've never had any problem getting people to advise me because I have a really big mission. I want to help entrepreneurs grow companies, create jobs, be successful. I mean, that's 
a big personal mission. So all kinds of people get excited about a large mission. Second, the values. I would call them the terms of engagement. And what are values? Well, values for me are how you're going to run the business. Integrity, teamwork. Uh, one of my companies called Reflexive Optimizing, as in how the market changes and they, they flex and reflect that. Um, another called it the Twyla Factor, named it after his dog. You know, plays well with others, happy, right. doesn't start fights, doesn't ever back down. That was more important to him than college degrees. So whatever it is, to be able to define those and then to be able to select people in on the basis of those and to be able to manage people's performance and or terminate them on the basis of those, they're equally as important as their performance competency in the job. That's right. And also it goes back to it is a fact that small companies, startup companies, as well as big companies have personalities and successful ones have very, very clear clear personalities in the market. I mean, you look at a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Facebook, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, for example. So as a startup, as an entrepreneur, and if you're doing it by yourself, which is rare, um, um, but if you're doing with a team of four or five people, it would be key, don't you think, to actually, you know, you need to sort of have part of that mission and value system that you're doing is also what sort of personality do you want to see reflected in that corporate mirror, in that startup mirror when you look at it. And I think that helps define part of your roadmap as yes. well. Yes, no, you are absolutely right. And in the beginning, if, it's, if you are indeed just starting a company, it can be a reflection of your values. If you're coming to this late and you have already employees and place in the market, whatever, then you need to do the process of finding out sort of what it is that everybody else thinks your values are, all your other employees, investors. Yes, does anybody else care? Yeah, and then decide, do I want those values? And if I don't want those, you know, one uh, entrepreneur found out that, uh, you know, people thought they were careless, they didn't care about their business, um, they, they kept people on hold, he didn't even know that they had uh, 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 rock music playing when, when the uh, uh, people were on hold on, on uh, waiting for... Uh, for, for the their service, service, the customer service people. And so, you know, he goes like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't want that kind of values. I've got to redefine the values and we have to re-engineer what's going on inside the company. So that's the second part. Just on that, this is a, a great question that's just come through from Andrew Mills. Um, and uh, his question is, do you see a difference between mission and vision? Is mission more important? I think that's a great question. Yes. They are interchangeable, but they do mean different things. Oh, absolutely. For me, the mission is, is what you're in business to do. Why are you in business over, over the long haul? The, the vision, which is the third building block that I didn't actually talk with, for me, the vision is no more than 60 months, probably more like three years or 36 months. And that is what I can vision our company actually doing in order to... Uh, take steps toward that larger mission right. that we have in place. So what what are those goals that I want to achieve? Um, how many people do I want to serve? What are the ways that I think my customers need to be served? Does that mean we have offices in different places? Does it mean we have a different profile of employees? Does it mean we've gone international? So uh, then, then you have to step back and actually develop your operational plan and your action plan and your sales plan and your you know, staffing plan and all of those things in terms of what's, what's going to take you this year toward the vision of three years, which is then toward that larger mission that you have. So definitely, Andrew, I see a difference between the two. Great. Can, uh, can I ask, too, because in um, my experience in venture capital and, as, and in a startup company in, in the U.S. and also in advising entrepreneurs these days, what I've noticed that is different in the last sort of 15 years when we talk about a business plan for entrepreneurs they mean different things today than they did 15 years ago. You know, 15 t uh, years ago, it was like people would do these business plans that were 50, 60 pages long and, you know, drilled down into everything and whatever. And, of course, a lot of these numbers were made up and massage and whatever. These days, in the places like Silicon Valley, New York, Silicon Alley, you know, uh, San Francisco and other parts around the world, including Australia, more and more, it's really more about the elevator pitch. I mean, having that clear... Uh, compelling reason why you've got your product technology slash service, what makes you better at doing this than anybody else. So that's your elevated pitch for, for investors and to get people excited about it. Where does that business plan, where does that more detailed business plan come into play? Oh, these it, days? it's absolutely critical if you want to get your employees aligned. And if the number one issue is that most employees don't have a clue how their performance impacts 
the overall performance of the business, which is true, then the way you take care of that problem, the way you reinforce the values is by actually getting people in your company involved in the planning process. So when I work with companies, we start with top management and the executive team figuring out what are the goals for this year and what are two or three strategies that we're going to pursue for each of those goals. And we take that, each of them takes that back into the division of departments. And the departments then decide what are the particular action plans that we're going to use to get there. In other words, if we want 10 more clients this year, like 10% increase the clients, what are we going to do to do that? We're not going to sit here at the top level, but we are going to figure out are we going to do more events? Are we going to do more conferences? Are we going to be on boards? Are we going to... So there are actual actions that people take and that people sign up as become part of their job performance expectations for the year that are all in concert with reaching those strategies which will achieve those goals. And so when you report back to people on sort of how's the company doing overall, you know exactly what, the, what that's related to and they know where they need to push harder or where they're doing well or what's working and what isn't working. And so I think planning needs to be very much top down, grassroots, bottom up. And the companies that I work with that do that just absolutely start to fly. So right. that's how I would respond to that. So why are we in business? How do we do business? And what do we want to achieve? What's the plan to get us there? Right. So three parts of what I call the foundation we need to grow. Absolutely. And number and the third? Well, the third is you don't know what you don't know. You don't know how to grow a company. So let me use a couple of examples. I'm just fascinated that uh, there's a whole TV program with Caesar and the dog whisperer, right? People who buy puppies and bring them home are clueless what to do, uh, and then the puppy rules the household or chews or pees or whatever puppies do, and they're you know about ready to put the dog down. In fact, it's the owner's problem that they didn't know how to train and manage the dog. Okay, famous entrepreneur last week said. I looked at my new daughter and I said to my wife, there should be a law against what's about to happen. We're taking this thing home and we don't have a clue what to do. So for those who start a company, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. They don't know. It's easy to start a company. It's easy to get pregnant. It's really hard to, to grow a child, to grow a company. So a newborn you know, requires everything from you. You have to, to do it all, be there when it cries, minister to it and so forth. But if you behave as a parent, with a three-year-old the way a newborn does, you're not teaching three-year-old the skills they need in order to survive in the world. Seven-year-old, 12-year-old, teenager, you know, each of these times you have to behave differently as a parent. So you need to relate differently to your company as it goes through different stages. In the beginning, you're the big red dot, and I have a whole, whole session that I do on stages of growth. You're doing everything, making all the decisions. You hire people who will do it your way. But if you stay doing and behaving that way, your company will be choked off. You will be the bottleneck to grow. My dad was in startup for 30 years. He didn't understand what he was doing wrong. So, so he remained a startup. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. He wanted to grow. He just couldn't change his behavior. He couldn't bring in people. He couldn't delegate. He couldn't hire people smarter than he was. He couldn't take their advice. You know. So there were just a whole lot of things that you need to do. And our research has shown that if you do do that, you begin to change your roles as leader. If you bring in the team that you talked about before, bring in people that you can delegate to first and then work as a team and then bring in people who have been smarter than you are, so you, then you can really grow a company. I mean, this whole question of like roles, I mean, if, you, if you're starting a, a business and you say there's, you know, several of you, but, I mean, some of the roles seem pretty clear. It's like, oh, you, you're, you're, you're good at marketing, you know, you do marketing, I'm, I'm a technology person, I'll do technology, oh, you're, a, you're more leader, you do that. That sounds sort of quite a simple delineation when you first start, but as the company does start to shape and and hopefully grow, those roles become very, very, uh, you know, very, very distinct, and it's really, really important that everybody knows those differences. So, so you know, it, 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 that's when the naivety and the, the lack of sophistication starts to really, the cracks start to emerge at that, at that time. So Yes, yes, two kinds of problems. One is get five technologists who come together. Right. None of them know anything but technology. That's a disaster. Or you get three people who come together and go, well, okay, I'll take over the marketing and sales. They're not good at it, but they take it over. Right. And over time, you know, the company needs more than they have to offer. And so they either need to be willing to say, I can't, I, I either have to go off and get more training in marketing or 
we have to bring in somebody who's smarter than somebody else. else. And that, that, or, that and if you've cheap. already shared equity equally with three or four partners, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So setting it up from the beginning so that the company can grow and understand it. And the reason why, you know, the team is so important, so important, we won't even look at people into our accelerator unless there's a team that's in place and ready to come. We won't, we've actually done a two-for-one offer to the leader forum so that people can actually bring a team member because we want more than one person to be with I think that's a great idea. So let's talk about that for just a second. I mean, one of, you know, another, another truism in, in the world of entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship, starting a company, has to be learned experientially. It's, it's you've got it, you know, there's, there's, you can't learn it out of a book. You can read and you can get great ideas, but you have to go through it in order to go through it. Um, so that experiential experience is about doing what you experience directly, but absolutely also through the experience of others. And that means engaging with others that have done it before. Now, one of the great things about the ANZ Innovators Accelerator Program in Sydney on November 15th, that's the leader forum. Program. The leader forum leader program, program is that uh, it is about not just like problem solving skills that are common mistakes that entrepreneurs make, but providing the access to entrepreneurs and people that have made these mistakes before and hopefully come through them. So tell us a little bit yes. about that and what makes you different. So the leader forum was something that we actually developed when I was at Kaufman um, as a way to encourage. Um, entrepreneurs to share their learning with each other, but to make sure that they weren't sharing ignorance with each other. Right. Because if exactly. you actually are sharing the wrong lessons, you mm -hmm. run off the cliff together. So we have small group sessions where you're really bearing down on a particular topic. In this case, we're going to address issues around uh, product and service development, choosing the right channels to market, and then your leadership, the changing roles right. and responsibilities as you move out of um, startup growth into initial growth. So. That means that we're going to be spending uh, several hours focused on that with somebody like Sandy. You should be so lucky to be in the session where Sandy is facilitating mentoring. And we'll be going through, and, and, and for each group, we'll be identifying the four or five issues that that group wants to focus on with regard to developing your product or service. So you'll focus on that. You actually have a learning journal that you'll be taking notes in. And then some time at the end, um, half an hour or so, where you're thinking through, right, what do I need to do differently back in my company? Who else do I need to talk to? What are some of the changes that I need to make? Then we'll come together for a joint lunch where all the groups will come together. And then in the afternoon, we'll go off and spend time with a different facilitator focusing on issues of choosing the right channels and market. How do you get to your markets? And there are at least 10 different ways yes. of getting to market. Yes. And, and the problem is most people don't even think, don't know enough to even think through when they choose the wrong way to go to market, they choose an expensive way, they think they need to have sales reps or they think they can do it all on the web. So getting smarter about how you how you get to market. And again, many experienced you know, executives of big Fortune 500 companies are still making those aftermarket mistakes today. So it's nothing... You know, these happen daily, um, and and uh, every time there's a new product, there may be a different path to market. So it's it's if it's if, it's, if the world is spinning, your strategy is changing you know, pretty well. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we'll have an event on Friday night where we'll be together, and then Saturday um, we'll be focused on uh, if you haven't if you haven't already d discussed leadership, um, uh, we'll be focusing on leadership. You know, you may not march through in this particular order, but right. we'll cover all the more these three topics. Right, so it's sort of leading at that stage of growth. And it's not just leading at that stage, it's knowing what's the next stage so that you can start leading there and pull the company along into growth itself. And so that's one of the keys to being able to grow is where the leader understands what needs to happen, starts behaving at that, and then brings the executive team in to play the roles that he or she used to play. And I think one of the great qualities of that is not just what you get during those three, you know, two, three days, but also the relationships that you build are often just lasting relationships that you can tap you can tap these people with these skills um, after long after the uh, the seminar or workshop or the program has finished and that we all you know if, if, if you don't know as entrepreneurs how critical growing and expanding your network is um, then you really need to suss that out because it's it's almost it's almost everything after you've got a great idea well, it is, and you know that's the key. Lots of times, people won't come to sessions because they didn't know who else is going to be there. Am I really going to get value 
Well, you're going to get lots of value because it's the CEOs who are trying to grow their companies. It's the mentors and the facilitators who are themselves uh, successful CEOs who've done this before, venture capitalists who've worked with companies before. They're the ones who are really going to be there. So we don't have to worry about sort of folks in there who don't know what's going on or people who are service providers and really haven't ever grown a company. So it's, it's as you say, all about who you learn from mm. and who you make the relationships with. Right. So just to clarify that uh, the Leader Forum is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday through noon, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday through noon. And that's, we'll be doing one of those in Sydney and one of those in Melbourne. And we, we may be doing others in Perth and Brisbane um, in, 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 in fall. I guess it's your fall. I have to get used to this since I'm from America. It'll be April and May. Um, the, the Accelerator Program is a three-month program. It is resident. You have to go to Adelaide be part of that program. Those right. applications close November 30th. But we're still looking for people who have teams, people who want to grow their companies, um, and people who, who will learn by being co-located with another 10 companies. And this is a uh, registration for the Leader Forum, an application and selection process that goes on with the accelerator. Okay, excellent. So, so the, you know, a lot of the companies that will be at this forum are eligible, could be very could much be. eligible yep. for, for the Accelerator could program. Could be. Yes. Okay. It's possible. Yeah. Talent scouting as well. Yeah, well, right? yeah, it's possible. I mean, it's all yeah. part of it. So. Yes, what we're really trying to do is to share the knowledge that I've gained over all the years of all the research, all the companies I've worked with around the world, to share the knowledge with more people so that companies in Australia can, can learn how to grow and, and create more jobs and that all feeds into a healthier economy? It's, it's, it's a very important thing. I mean, I, I'm an Australian, but I've spent the last 15 years in the U.S. and recently come back. And what, and I think that the energy, the entrepreneurial energy here uh, is, is, is astounding. It's, it's, been, it's raised so much compared to, uh, to 15, uh, 20 years ago. But there's still, we still struggle in Australia in the entrepreneur, as entrepreneurs and as, as, as uh, people that want to build out the entrepreneurial ecosystem to keep building that density of entrepreneurial expertise. And so you basically, there's two challenges from, you know, from our point of view is that, that are running these programs and advising startups and trying to build this, this talent is expanding and broadening the network, the ecosystem, but even more importantly, making it deeper, making the knowledge base and the success stories a deeper set of examples to choose from because literally success does breed success. Um, and, 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 and failing failing is a part of that road to success in entrepreneurism as well. So we will share successes and we will learn from failures. Yes, lessons from the edge. That's right, lessons <laughs> from the edge, exactly. Exactly. Tim, do you have any more great quotes to end with? Uh, well, um, I think um, one I love, I love too, and I think is often forgotten, and this, and this is particularly, I think, useful in in the world of increasing like digital content based industries, either you know gaming or sort of content, multimedia content services. Um, ideas can be great, but worthless on their own. Skillful execution is priceless. Value is created through diligent, hard work. Yes. Um, it is hard. So, you know, it is a huge, huge leap from sitting around the table with a bunch of friends or, you know, or, you know, dinner party and saying, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. I mean, I've done that millions of times. But, um, but then having the energy to put that together, to formulate a, uh, a product strategy, a market strategy, an executive strategy, an advisory board, funding, you know, that, yes. that, that takes huge commitment and you've got to go in with your eyes as wide open as they could possibly be and always 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 the difference between success and failure i mean there's many reasons for failure that people shouldn't take personally because failure is very much a part of it but always the difference between success and not working is execution yes i agree we talk about the magic dollar 10 cents is the idea 90 cents is execution. So we are totally aligned on that. Right, exactly. And I've just had a request to repeat the quote, so I'll repeat it as best I can because I've sort of written it roughly. But it's, ideas can be great but are worthless on their own. Skillful execution is priceless. Value is created through diligent hard work. And I'm pretty sure um, 
I think that's Sandy Plunkett. Actually, that was my quote. That's I was, Sandy Plunkett's I was, I was quote. Gonna, I was going to give it to Jerry Kaplan, actually, but he's just another one that I quoted up and up above. So that's why I made that up. <laughs> so, um, okay, so to register for the Leader Forum, please go to www.jedo.me forward slash events forward slash 7351. I'll repeat that www.jedo.me forward slash events forward slash 7351. Okay, thank you so much. We hope we've uh, helped to help uh, the listeners out there, and we look forward to seeing you in person at uh, somewhere along the lines, hopefully, at the Leader Forum. Great, thanks so thank much. Thank you, Dr. Dana Matthew. Absolutely, my pleasure. Bye bye. The organizer has ended the session and this